Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Agnieszka Żelazna. I represent Lublin University of Technology. And today, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you, both our audience in auditorium and uh, online participants, to the fourth meeting, Science Without Borders, which is a part of the 17th Lublin Science Festival. Before I start presentation of our special guests, I would like to invite Professor Zbigniew Pastuszak, Vice Rector for Development and Business Cooperation uh, of Marie Curie Skłodowska University, to take a voice. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Professor Bennett, good evening. Uh, it is my honor and privilege uh, on behalf of the uh, director of the Maria Curie Skłodowska University, Professor Radosław Dobrowolski and the university authorities uh, to welcome you at this uh, hospitable space of the Academic Center for Culture and Media, Hatka Rzeka. Welcome and good evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are in the middle of the Lublin Science Festival. Um, Every uh, evening we have a special guest. Today uh, we have a very special guest from the area of science. I think uh, uh, very interested, very future for plenty of us. Professor Charles Henry Bradett. Uh, professor uh, received his uh, PhD from Harvard University. So I think he exactly knows what he is doing and what he's, uh, what kind of research he is doing. So. Professor, I hope today you will teleport us to the space of your idea and research uh, interest. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for being with us. So I wish you all a um, very profitable evening. Thank you very much. Your Magnificence, thank you for this short introduction to our event. Now I am pleased to welcome our special guests. The main roles of today's event will be played by Professor Charles Bennett and Mr. Karol Jałuchowski. Before we listen to the lecture given by Professor Charles Bennett, I would like to briefly present his figure with the main emphasis on his impressive scientific career. Charles Bennett graduated from Croton Hampton High School in 1960 and from Brandeis University, majoring in chemistry in 1964. He received his PhD from Harvard in 1971 for molecular dynamic studies. During his academic and research career, he cooperated with IBM Research, University of Boston, University of Montreal, Thomas J. Watson Research Center, and many more teams. Professor Bennett is a physicist with surprisingly broad scientific interests. In early 70s, he has worked on various aspects of the relation between physics and information. It was of fundamental significance to the future pioneer of quantum informatics. In 1973, Professor Bennett published a groundbreaking paper on logical reversibility of computing, where he showed that calculations can be performed in a reversible way. It was a prophetic outcome since reversibility constitutes the basis for the idea of quantum computer. In early 80s, Professor Bennett proposed a reinterpretation of Maxwell Limon using the information theory, showing that the finite capacity of its memory must result in destroying information, which is always a thermodynamically irreversible process. Together with his team, Professor Bennett introduced the first quantum protocol for encrypting information, built the first quantum key distributor, beginning the rapid development of quantum cryptography. At the beginning of the 1990s, Professor Bennett worked in the field of the theory of communication. He opened the way to the discovery of quantum teleportation. He has also significantly contributed to the theory of quantum channels. Professor Bennett's achievements have formed the basis for a new field of science, the quantum information theory. Charles Bennett is an author or co-author of papers cited more than 92,000 times, including publication in world-leading journals like Nature. His work on quantum teleportation has been cited over 50,000 times. Charles Bennett is, among others, an IBM fellow, a fellow of American Physical Society and a member of the American Academy of Sciences. He was awarded Harvard Prize 
Dirac Medal, Wolf Prize in Physics, BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award, and Claude Shannon Award. What is more, he is able to combine a successful professional life with a happy family and a passion for photography and music. We are proud to host this exceptional guest in our city. However, we should remember that Lublin is a city of inspiration. Uh, some of us are inspired by arts, history, and others also by science. I feel that our second speaker today belongs to the latter group. Mr. Karol Jawochowski may be known to our audience as excellent journalist and editor of Politica, author of the documentary series Pioneers, devoted to outstanding thinkers of the era, including Daniel Dennett, Freeman Dyson, and Charles Bennett, and author of the book. Since the year 2000, he has been writing for several years, also making film materials about the borderlands of science, culture, and philosophy. Previously, he was an editor-in-chief of the Polish radio website. He collaborated with the monthly Świat Nauki. Karol Jawochowski was also the scholarship holder of the Center of Quantum Technologies, National University of Singapore. Since 2017, he has been collaborating with the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico, the Center of Complexity Research. He is also the winner of Grand Press Award for a film and reporter dedicated to Roy Glauber. Karol Jawochowski is a physicist by profession and graduate of Marie Curie Skłodowska University. So later in the evening, you will witness a conversation between two physicists. Now I am pleased to invite you to listen to Professor Bennett's lecture entitled Insights from Physics into Information Theory and Vice Versa. Professor. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I don't have to tell you about information because we live in an information revolution. Uh, but I'm going to step back a little bit and talk about how we have learned to think about information mathematically. And all mathematics is an abstraction from everyday experience. Uh, and the, the information revolution that started in the middle of the last century uh, was based on separating the idea of information from the physical carriers of the information, even though the word, like a digit, is originally one of these things, and now we think of it as a zero or a one. But these notions on which the theory of information processing was based are now known to be too narrow. And, and I'm going to talk about two ways in, they were, in which they were too narrow. One has been in investigated for a long time, and that has to do with the connection of information to physical quantities like energy and entropy. And uh, the other one is a newer field that, that I've been more involved in lately, but it is not, uh, despite the introduction here, uh, so much my work. It's work that gradually became evident to me and other scientists during the, the uh, beginning around 19, 1970. Uh, and that was that the whole theory of communication and computing and the processing of information should be rebuilt on the basis, on the foundation of qu quantum physics rather than on the basis of what, what a physicist would call classical physics. That, that, well, we'll get to that part of the story. So uh, conventionally, information carriers like, a, like a, a memory stick that you put in your computer or a book uh, would, were viewed by, uh, as what a physicist would call a classical system. You can observe their state without disturbing it. Uh, and if you have two, uh, two books, you can perfectly describe the state of each one by describing the state of this one and describing the state of that one. And a perfect description of the whole is equal to a perfect description of this part and a perfect description of that part. Now those two self-evident things are actually 
not no, not true about objects in nature, and th this is not these are not objects that people handle in in their everyday life. These are microscopic objects, and so physicists and chemists have long l known that that uh, that atoms and photons and small things like that behave differently. If you attempt to observe the state of a, of one of these small particles, you will in inevitably disturb it. You've heard of the uncertainty principle. And then the other thing, which you've probably also heard of it, that two particles can exist in what's called an entangled state, which means that the state of the two of them together is perfectly well-defined, but each one behaves randomly. They behave randomly in a way that is so intimately coupled that if you make an observation on this one, you get a random result, but you know exactly how the other one would behave. So that's that's the that's the the strange and and exciting idea I want to get across to you tonight. Uh, but anyway, for most of the 20th century, these these were not thought to be important for information processing, and mainly they were thought to be as a nuisance. The uncertainty principle caused the small transistors to behave less reliably than their than uh, uh, switches and cog wheels. And now it's known that these quantum effects have positive consequences and they make possible new kinds of information processing. One of them was quantum cryptography that I've been involved in. And uh, another is the dramatic speed up of some kinds of classically hard computations if you could build a quantum computer. But I think from a philosophical and, 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 and almost like a, a general education point of view, Entanglement helps explain why quantum effects were so inconspicuous and remained undiscovered until the 20th century. Well, the differences, but there are important differences between uh, classical and, 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 and quantum information. And that everybody knows this now that you don't need a, a 10 digit alphabet. You can make do with just zeros and ones. And anything that you need to do to the information to transform it, for example, from a file in your computer into a screen which shows you a, a movie, can be done by acting on these bits one and two at a time. Uh, and of course, the, the whole uh, usefulness of computers comes from the fact that it doesn't matter what physical forms the bits are in. They can be a, a flash of light in an optical fiber or a pulse of electricity in a wire, or as I'm speaking to you out now, a variation of air pressure, as long as they can be operated on with those uh, logic operations, uh, it, it works just as well. Now there's a parallel theory which was implicit in the discoveries of early 20th century physicists and chemists, but they weren't thinking about their their stuff in their laboratories as having to do with information processing, and that is, any quantum state can be reduced to the considering the state of, of what we call now qubits, and that is a system that has two reliably distinguishable states, but a continuum of states in between them, such as the, I will tell you later about the polarization of a photon. And any processing of this information, in other words, for example, what happens when a physical system spontaneously changes by itself, can be described and reduced to operating on these qubits one and two at a time. It's a sort of a computery way of thinking about physics, which people had thought about, as I'll tell you, for a long time in terms of using a computer to solve Newton's laws of motion. But the, the computer, a quantum computer, could solve these laws of motion just as well. Well, now, everybody knows what ordinary classical information is. We just call it information. It's like the information in a book or on a website. Uh, you can copy it as, as you want. Occasionally you may get in trouble for violating a copyright, but you're not breaking any laws of nature, just the laws of, 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 you know, of, of, of lawyers. Uh, and it's not disturbed by reading it. But quantum information, if you want to explain it without any mathematics, it behaves like the information in a dream. And if you try to describe your dream to someone, you gradually forget the dream 
and only remember what you said about it. And of course, you can repeat that to as many people as you want, but the original dream is gone. You can't prove what you dream to someone else, and you can lie about your dream without getting caught. How many people here have lied about their dreams? Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's very hard to, to lie about your dream to your spouse. It's not worth even trying, I should, in my experience. Uh, but unlike dreams, quantum information obeys well-known laws. And I'm going to say quantum information, or quantum theory is supposed to be one of the most scary and, and, and uh, inscrutable parts of physics. And it unfortunately got that reputation partly because of Einstein, who was really the only physicist. Well, maybe in Lublin, uh, Marie uh, Sklodowska Curie is, 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 is equally well known to Einstein. But throughout most of the world, Einstein is the only physicist they know. Maybe they might know Newton. But uh, anyway, Einstein didn't like quantum mechanics. And most people think, well, if Einstein couldn't understand it and didn't like it, why, what, why should I even? think that I could understand. But in fact, the basis of it is extremely simple, but it, it's, it's, it's as counterintuitive as the thing that Einstein discovered, that space and time are connected in, in a very definite way that is completely opposed to what everyday experience is that suggests that they're entirely separate. Uh, and the fact that that is such a jump of intuition is reflected in the fact that science fiction stories always talk about faster than light travel. And the, the average person, if you tell them that Einstein showed that, that you cannot travel faster than the speed of light, their reaction is, well, who's Einstein to tell me how fast I can travel? You know, they, they, so, so that once you understand even special relativity, you can understand why thinking that you can travel arbitrarily fast is something that it is, is not possible in, in, in the world as, as, as we understand it scientifically. Instead of being an obvious thing you ought to be able to do, it's an obvious thing that you can't do. But you have to, you have to change your frame of your mind. And the thing, the change of the frame of the mind that you need to do for quantum mechanics is equally strange and equally simple. So I'll say what the fundamental principle of quantum mechanics is. I'll tell you in a moment here. It's called the superposition principle. It says that physical systems like an atom or two atoms or, or uh, a pencil uh, have some number of reliably distinguishable states. But not all states are reliably distinguishable. So it's possible for two states to be different but not reliably distinguishable. So that in if in this state and it's in this state that's similar, if you if you look at it, this one will sometimes behave like this one and this one will sometimes behave like that one. Well that that's not hard to accept. You know, if you if you write a number uh, on a piece of paper, somebody says, Well that looks like a one, and somebody else says, Well, I think really that's a seven. So that's a sort of impartial distinguishability of of classical information. But quantum mechanics says it's a more it's a more mathematical and subtle kind of partial distinguishability. So physical states behave not so much like points in space, like here or here or here, but like directions in states, space. And any two directions that are perpendicular correspond to reliably distinguishable states. And any two directions that are not perpendicular correspond to states that are different, but not reliably distinguishable. Oh, so that's 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 it. Oh, I should say these states, these directions are. That's the easy part. The hard part is the directions are not in ordinary three-dimensional space. They're in a space that has as many dimensions as the system has reliably distinguishable states. So there are systems whose state space has only two dimensions, and that means there are only two reliably distinguishable states. And I can represent them by like compass directions in a plane. Uh, so this state and this state are reliably distinguishable, but these two states are not. 
Or you could have ones that have three reliably distinguishable states, four or five, any, any finite number. Uh, but it's a property of the system, the dimensionality of its state space. And the rule then is that the possible states of the system are like directions in that higher dimensional space. Now we can think in up to three dimensions. Unfortunately, the first size of state space that gives really interesting quantum effects has four dimensions. But I'll treat you to think about four-dimensional space a little bit. Uh, so it can have more dimensions, but within that, uh, within that space, any direction is a possible state, and the, the, the behavior of a system, if you're not disturbing it and poking at it and, and, and making it behave randomly, is just a, a rotation in that state. So the, the behavior of a physical system left to itself is a rotation in a large finite dimensional space. That's pretty much, oh, so you can see a rotation preserves perpendicularity. If I rotate two perpendicular directions, they stay perpendicular. And if I rotate two directions that are not perpendicular, they stay not perpendicular. And that's true in any number of dimensions, although I can't show it to you in more than three. So that's it, you don't have to learn any more math. So here are some physical examples of it. Uh, the, the nice example of it is that it, it, light, it, it, in addition to traveling at the speed of light in some direction, has a polarization. It, it, in it, you, your human eye can't see the polarization very well, but sunglasses can. They tend to block horizontal polarization and transmit vertical polarization. And, and bees can see the polarization of sunlight. But in other words, if I send a, a, a beam of light at you, the the electric field is vibrating along some direction, which can be any direction perpendicular to the direction of travel. And so I've got some diagrams here of how that works. Here we have, I can prepare a beam of horizontal photons that comes along, and I can use them to carry, uh, well, I also here's a beam of vertical photons. And these behave differently, because if I have a material like calcite, it's, a, it's just a transparent material that is less symmetric than something like a diamond or, or, or a rock salt. And because of this lack of symmetry, the ways the, the atoms are arranged in there, uh, horizontal photons will go straight through, and vertical photons will go take a diagonal path while they're inside the crystal and come out in a shifted beam. So that means you can use the polarization of a photon to carry one bit of information. But the photon can have any other polarization in between, for example, some angle theta. And what it happens if you send these photons into the same crystal is something very strange happens. They don't all behave the same way. They're all the same to begin with, but some of them go into the horizontal beam and the rest of them go into the vertical beam. And the ones that go into the horizontal beam become horizontal and the ones that go into the vertical beam become vertical. And this angle, instead of being reproduced as a is a, a determinate outcome of this process, in fact, it appears only as the probability. So this is, this is the sort of the first, or one of the first mysteries of quantum mechanics, which you should be able to understand by the time I'm done. Otherwise, I'm going to begin to hold lecture again one hour later, and then see if you understand it after that. Uh, so uh, a person who's very experienced in undergraduate education, one of the six co-authors of, of the most famous paper I'm on, which is about uh, quantum teleportation, which we'll get to, he, he uh, uses this analogy to describe the way photons behave when you try to measure their polarization. Uh, so here's this, this, this problem. This is what I've described. So we have photons that are all prepared in the same state, but when you send them into this apparatus, they behave differently. The apparatus, you see the photons are traveling along, they split into two beams, and if you want, you can count them in a photon detector, which works like a Geiger counter, it gives you a little click when the photon arrives. So he says, well, the way this is, works is like uh, the interaction between the teacher and the pupil 
in an old-fashioned school where this, the, this, the students were supposed to listen but not ask questions and only answer the question that the teacher asks. So uh, in, the, in this case, the photon is like the, is like the student and the, the measuring apparatus, the uh, apparatus of the crystal and the detectors is like the teacher. And the, uh, because the, the uh, well, this is what happens. So the, the teacher says to the photon, is your polarization vertical or horizontal? And the photon says, I'm polarized at about 55. The teacher says, I believe I asked you a question. Are you vertical or horizontal? Horizontal, sir. Did you ever have any other polarization? No, sir. I was always horizontal. Okay, so that's how they behave. First, I can tell you what you can do with this, and then the harder thing, but the more important thing, is to understand why they behave that way and why everything in nature, even things that seem to not behave that way, doesn't behave that way because of the way at a deeper level it does behave that way. Okay, but here's what you can, what you can do with this. What this means is that the, these two kinds of photons are distinguishable, and these two kinds of photons are distinguishable, but not all four kinds. And I show you why they're distinguishable, because I already showed you how you can distinguish vertical from horizontal. To distinguish the two diagonal kinds, we just rotate this observing apparatus by 45 degrees. So now it's aligned along these two axes, perfectly distinguishes these two kinds of photons, but it can't distinguish those anymore. And the fact that it cannot distinguish them is not a, a limitation of the measuring apparatus, it's the fundamental law of physics. It comes out of this, what I told you, the superposition principle. And the first uh, use of this, it actually, I said it was invented in 1968, I found out more recently, but only published in 83, by an extremely gifted colleague of ours who just died a few months ago. Uh, he was very, very publicity averse. And he wrote this paper in 1968, uh, told a few people about it, didn't try very hard to get it published. And, and most people didn't take it very seriously, but, but several of my colleagues and I did, and we started working on this field, and that, that's what, what it grew into. But his insight was, because photons behave this way, you can use them to make banknotes, in principle, that can't be copied by a counterfeiter. You know how banknotes that come out from a from a, a cash machine, they have various devices on them that make them hard to copy. But nobody claims that they're impossible to copy. In fact, uh, the the I don't know about the Polish banknotes, but the the German banknotes used to have printed on each banknote what the punishment for copying them is. Uh, but this one, this one doesn't have a, pu a punishment. It just says, anybody can read Latin. Do you know what that says? It says, I will not be duplicated. And so you can see what it does. It consists of 20 polarized photons of those four kinds uh, in perfectly reflective boxes. Now, that's the part that's a little hard to make nowadays. You can store these quantum states with great difficulty. So if you try to make a piece of quantum money, it would be about as big and expensive as a car, and it would store the, the uh, photons for, for maybe an hour. So it would only be good for countries which have very rapid inflation. So this was a very impractical invention, but it was the first invention that used quantum effects to do something with information that you can't do with ordinary information, which is to make it absolutely impossible to copy. Now, why is it impossible to copy? Because the, the, the bank, I should say it works, the bank has a list of which photons are on this particular banknote and what their full polarization is. But the counterfeiter doesn't have it. So the counterfeiter has to go and try to measure them, and they'll measure some of them the wrong way and get them to behave randomly. So they'll probably be caught because they'll make something that isn't the same as the original. Oh, and then we developed, Gilles Brassard and I, 
where they made the first implementation of this, where we use these same four states not to store a message, but to send a message over a distance of about this long with the proof that if there was an eavesdropper on this part of it, the eavesdropper couldn't read the message without disturbing it so much that we would catch them in the act of reading it. So that's quantum cryptography. But now it's progressed to much further uh, realizations. As the satellite, the Chinese Misha satellite launched in what, 20, 2017, was able to distribute quantum information between two places uh, 12, 1,200 kilometers apart on Earth instead of just 30 centimeters the way we did. Well, getting back to the theory of it, I said that measuring an unknown photon's polarization is impossible. So, for example, you can't take a photon like this and find out what its polarization is. Cloning it is impossible because if you could make arbitrarily many copies of it, then you could measure them with, with an apparatus and gradually rotate it around and find the, the, the maximum angle of, trans, of, of, of the one beam versus the other. <clears throat> but there is, you know, there's a, something that does amplify photons, and that is <clears throat> a laser. A laser is an amplifier of photons, and it's a polarization-preserving amplifier, except that lasers don't work very well if you give them an input signal that's too faint. So in fact, if you give a, a laser a one photon input signal, these two things are equally probable, that it, that it copies your photon, but that it doesn't copy your photon and, and emits a random photon at the same time. In other words, it pollutes the amplified signal by just enough noise that besides being brighter, it's not any more useful in figuring out what the original polarization was. Now this discovery of how lasers behave and how you can't copy quantum information was implicit in the laws of quantum mechanics known since the 1920s, but the significance was only gradually, uh, it, it was only gradually realized by this work of Wiesner that I told you about that came out in 1968, but hardly anybody knew about it. And then by an interesting, uh, which I'll get to, series of papers where someone thought you could clone on quantum information and therefore violate Einstein and travel faster than the speed of light. And the paper saying that was published and the refutation of that paper led to the understanding of the importance of this, what is now called the no cloning principle for quantum information. But I'll get to that later. I just said though that there was a lot of parallelism, undiscovered parallelism between the laws of processing quantum information and the laws of processing classical information. And just as I said that any classical information processing can be done by working on the bits one and two at a time, any quantum information processing can be done by working on the qubits one and two at a time. So here is, well, what is a one qubit rotation? Well, I told you a, a qubit, a two-state quantum system, is like a direction in two-dimensional space. So a, a angle-preserving transformation of something in two-dimensional space is a rotation. So a, a one qubit operation can just be thought of as a rotation like that. What's a two bit, two qubit rotation? Two bits, it's, it's something that operates on two qubits. I'm gonna, photons, I'm gonna have a, a, a green photon and an orange one. So here's a Q, two qubit operation. I'm gonna encode my one as a vertical photon and the zero as a horizontal photon. So if the, if the one foot, one, the green photon is in the one state and the orange one is in the zero state, the green one says rotate the, the other one by 90 degrees. But if the green photon is in the, in the zero state, the horizontal state says don't do anything to the other photon. So this is a very basic logic operation. A computer scientist would call it exclusive or. A mathematician would call it addition modulo two. Uh, so it says it uses the first one to control whether the second one is left alone or is rotated. To, to the opposite state. Well, now this is a quantum operation, so it has to obey the superposition principle, and that means the diagonal direction, which it can be thought of as the direction midway in two-dimensional space between horizontal and vertical. And if this is what a diagonal photon's quantum state is, it's this state. But if you had to write it in terms of vectors, it would be 
an equal amount of this vector and less, plus an equal amount of that vector divided by the square root of 2 because that keeps the vectors the same length, which makes it less confusing, I hope. Uh, but what we see is that it's an equal, it has to do a superposition of these two things, which means the state is as midway in four-dimensional space between both photons being horizontal and both photons being vertical. And that's a state that is an entangled state. That's why I've kind of labeled it blue. It's a state that cannot be thought of for entirely mathematical reasons as comprising a state of one particle and a state of the other particle. And I'll tell you what you do with those things. Oh, and I should say, it's, it's, I just said that. It's not the same as two particles uh, each being in the diagonal state. It is the same as both particles being in left diagonal, the state that's halfway between both being horizontal and both being vertical, if you do the mathematics in four-dimensional space, is exactly the same direction in four-dimensional space as this, but it's not the same as this one. So this is, you might say, the two photons are in the state of sameness of their polarization, even though neither one has a polarization of its own. And when you get, get comfortable with that idea, which is a correct idea about nature, but it's not the way little things that were, big things that we're used to behave. Uh, a, a, a quantum educated person, if you tell them that there are two possible situations, such as that, uh, that uh, Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden might have won the, the last election in my country, they will say, well, there, of course, that means there's also the possibility that they, that they, that they, uh, uh, Biden plus Trump divided by the square root of two, or Biden minus Trump divided by the square root of two. Those are also possible states. And I, I, I think, I think a number of my countrymen believe something like that, uh, even though they don't uh, have the right mathematics to process that information. Anyway, uh, so how do we explain this to, uh, to uh, a lay audience here? I'm, I'm, you're not a lay audience, you're just a, you're a, a oh, I, I, I'm, I will get to that in a moment, but here's sort of a, a pedagogic and a, a, a analog of entanglement. When I said about the, 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 the strict teacher and the, and the timid student, it's, it's a little bit like two, two, two students, Remus and Robulus, who are completely ignorant and unteachable about anything, but they always answer the same answer if you ask them the same question. So uh, a teacher asks a, a, a Remus, what's the color of growing grass? And he says, pink, sir. And Romulus in another classroom will say, uh, uh, same thing. Uh, and the, that's the way these photons, these entangled photons behave. So here's a picture of what happens. There's a process for generating a pair of entangled photons. And if you measure either one along any axis, you get a random result. For example, this one turns out to be vertical. And simultaneously, it seems like the other one has turned out to be vertical. Uh, it only does that half the time, but uh, if this one turns out to be vertical, that one turns out to be vertical also. Uh, so now, how are you going to, and that's true of any axis that you measure along. So the usual way you would, a, a, a normal person would like to think about this is to say, well, this process that generated the two photons, uh, it sometimes generates them both in this direction, sometimes in this direction, sometimes in that direction. It's not doing the same thing each time. Uh, and therefore, if, you, if it happens to be sending out a vertical, two vertical photons, and you measure them vertically, both vertically, then of course they'll come out the same. Well, the problem is, if that's what it's doing all the time, sometimes it will emit a pair of diagonal photons, but you will try to measure them vertically, and they will behave independently and randomly, and sometimes they will do this. So sometimes they will, if you make the same polarization measurement on them, they, they will behave differently. But if, if, the two, if the source is entangled, they'll always behave the same. So this is, this is a, a reason why you can't explain the result of this experiment by imagining each photon has a polarization of its own. So how do you explain it? Well, uh, the way I drew it in the picture, it looks like instantaneous action at a distance. And that is that as soon as you measure one, it turns out to be vertical, and it makes the other one decide to be vertical too, even though it being made a light year away. Uh, and even scientists talk about it that way, even though they know it's not true. Uh, and then you could say, well, why, 
How can this even happen? Supposing this one, this one, you, you pass it through a vertical filter and it gets through, so it knows that it's vertical. How does it get the message to this photon that has to be, he may not even know where the photon is. How does it know where to send the message to? Uh, and of course, it, it's faster than light messages. So this is just an unacceptable explanation. Well, what else can you say? Uh, well, of course, quantum mechanics gives the right answer. So that's, so we don't need another explanation. But, and I say, as soon as I, as you can think in four-dimensional space, you can think of exactly why this happens, so there's not a problem here. But then suppose you're at a dinner party and people say, I, I, they begin to tune out and go to a different table if you start talking about four-dimensional space. So I, this is what I have to do to keep the people at my table. I say, well, what's really happening is it's sending a random and uncontrollable message backward in time to the time when the two photons were created. And so when this one decides to be vertical, it said, by the way, I was always vertical and therefore my twin was also vertical. Or it doesn't matter in which order you measure it. Suppose uh, this one gets measured first and it says, oh, I'm vertical. Uh, in fact, I always was vertical and my twin always therefore was vertical. So whenever you get around to measuring him, he's, he'll be vertical too. Now, that, that is intriguing and uh, interesting to science fiction people. But it is, it is uh, inherently implausible because it, uh, it's, it seems to be like a kind of prophecy. So if, if I can communicate that way, why can't I send a message backward in time to my stockbroker to tell him what, what stocks to buy or sell yesterday? Why am I not rich? Uh, and so it, a message backward in time is safe from paradox one under two conditions. One of them was discovered uh, thousands of years ago, uh, and the other was discovered in the 20th century. Uh, it's safe from paradox is if, if the receiver disregards the message. This is the, the underlying principle of the Cassandra myth, where Cassandra was given the, the gift of prophecy with the punishment that nobody would believe her, and she predicted but failed to, to prevent the destruction of Troy. Uh, but the other thing is, this is the way entangled particles behave. The sender can't control a message, and therefore you shouldn't really even call it a message. It's, it's not something that has a direction if the sender can't control it. And this, I think, was really where Einstein went wrong. We'll get back to that later. But here's another way you can try to explain it. I'm uh, old enough that I was around in uh, San Francisco in what was called at the time the Summer of Love with the hippies, and they smoked a lot of marijuana and other things, uh, LSD. Uh, and they were full of people who were very optimistic about the state of the world, and they feel that uh, they're perfectly in tune with each other even though they don't have an opinion about anything. Uh, so, and, and, and they thought that with, with enough LSD that everybody could be in perfectly tuned with, in, with everybody else. But now we have a quantitative theory of entanglement. We know that it is monogamous. The more entangled two systems are with each other, the less entangled they can be with anything else. Uh, the hippies were not very good at monogamy either. Uh, and I'll tell you about the monogamy of entanglement now. It's really another way of looking at the no cloning principle. So here's an example of this. It's, I explained to you how you take two photons uh, and you put this control photon in a diagonal state, and this one is a zero state, and this one sort of half rotates the other one, but in the process gets changed by itself. So these two are in the states of both being vertical and both being horizontal at the same time. Uh, so suppose Alice and Bob decide that they become entangled. So this is the sort of the, 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 the certainly inaccurate analogy between the behavior of of simple systems like photons and complicated systems like the most complicated kind of interaction that people can have. But it's, it's, it's only intended as a metaphor. So Alice and Bob become entangled, so they're, they're really correlated as much as they can be and almost know what the other one is thinking at all times. Uh, and Bob says, well, that's nice. Let me, here I have another friend. I'm going to try to get entangled with her. So uh, he does that. Uh, and then he finds out that something's happened to his relationship to Alice. 
they're not completely correlated in every way. He's, the best that they can be is that they sort of have correlated randomness, but it's not perfectly correlated. And his relationship to Judy doesn't get to be any better than that either. And then, then the funniest thing that happens is, is that uh, if one of his girlfriends leaves, Bob will find his, his relationship with the other is, is degraded to a mere correlated randomness. But if they both stick around, he ends up perfectly entangled not with either one alone, but with the now non-trivial state of these two together. So he's perfectly entangled not with either one, but with the relationship between them, which you might say is an is a appropriate punishment. This was discovered also before the work of Wiesner and even before the work of Schrodinger uh, in, a, in, a, in a novel by the uh, artist Colette in 19, 1929, I think it was, or 1922. Uh, okay, so now what am I saying this has to do with, with uh, ordinary computers and ordinary data processing? So if I say this is a better theory of information, I ought to explain what a bit is in terms of a qubit and what a logic operation on a bit is in terms of uh, qubits. So that's not so hard. A, a bit is just a qubit with one of two distinguishable states. You can choose them however you want, for example, vertical and horizontal. A classical wire is a quantum channel that conducts those faithfully, but randomizes superpositions of them. And the reason it randomizes superpositions of them is that it behaves like this logic gate that I already told you about. That is, it's an interaction that if these are vertical or horizontal, makes a copy, into the, and, and then the copy gets lost in the environment, but if it's anything else, it becomes entangled. And this entangled state behaves randomly if you can't see the other part of it. So this is an, an, an explanation of where randomness comes from in the world. So it's a great philosophical import. A classical wire is a quantum channel with an eavesdropper. And a classical computer is, an e is a quantum computer with eavesdroppers on its, all its wires. So there are some computations, it turns out, which are s seriously slowed down by looking at all the intermediate stages of the computation, as if you were trying to do some computation and somebody's looking over your shoulder. Psychologically, it can disturb you, but in principle, it can disturb you also. And these are the computations that would be sped up by using a quantum computer. So now let's say where I just said I explained the origin of randomness. So here we s I j showed you this diagram of where Two pol polarized photons come in. They seem to behave randomly. Uh, where does that random behavior come from? Well, it comes from the fact that I, I didn't quite tell you the whole truth here. I said these photons come in here, and when they get into this crystal, some of them go into this path, and some of them go into that path. But what I should have said is that they enter an entangled state of being horizontal in this path and being vertical and in that path. So what has happened to them is not, is not irreversible and not random. They went from a definite state of all being diagonal to being a definite state that's in between the state of being horizontal and in this beam and vertical and being in that beam. And that means since you haven't really done anything irreversible to them, you can undo that operation, but provided you don't try to clone this information in any way. In other words, if you don't send them into detectors and count them and see which beam they're in. If instead you put them through uh, a, an optical device which rotates any photon that goes through it, rotates horizontal photons to vertical or vertical to horizontal. You could do that, That's a half wave plate will do it, or another thing you can do is to send it through a, a certain thickness of, of, a, of a sugar solution. And then once you've done that, and you send the beams back into a, a crystal of the same size, the two beams will get merged, and the horizontal photons will come out here. So what does this happen? How does this get expressed in terms of the, the, the uh, shy student analogy? Well, it's, what is happening is it's the public embarrassment of, of having to say his polarization in front of the whole class that makes him forget his original polarization. And if you could have him unsay that and have all the fellow students and the teacher not hear what he said, or un not, not, not hear, 
unhear what he said, then his polarization would be back to 55 degrees away it was originally in the way he was trying to say. So here's what you use an entanglement for. One of the things you use it for, it's seen the uncertainty principle. If I have a, a photon of unknown polarization and it, I have it here and I want to send it there without just sending it directly, I want to somehow get the information out of it here and reassemble it in, into a copy up there, it seems impossible because of the uncertainty principle. Well, what we showed was, in fact, if I, if I just do that, I'll measure, I get some partial information. For example, I might find out that the photon isn't horizontal, but that's not complete information about its polarization. So when I make a copy, it won't be a perfect copy. But here's what you do with quantum teleportation. You take an entangled pair of particles that you make separately, and then you take your own known state, and then you ask a question of these two particles. But it's a question about their relationship, not a question about either one individually. And from the answer to that question, you can find out what to do to this particle to put it into the same state as this one was before you destroyed its state by measuring it. So that's how quantum teleportation works. So see, you see what happens here. These photons certainly know nothing about the state of this photon. These two, you ask them a question, which I'll get to about their relation. The, it takes two bits of information to answer that uh, question. You take those two bits and you use them to rotate this photon. And when you do the math, it comes out in the same state as this one was in. And it hasn't broken any physical laws because the information cannot travel any faster than this classical message that can't go faster than the speed of light. And you have not copied the information because in order to get the copy, you have to first, before that, destroy the original. Oh, I don't know if I want to go through this story, this complicated story. OK, entanglement is ubiquitous. Almost any interaction creates entanglement. But why wasn't it discovered to the 20th, 20th century? Well, because of monogamy. Most systems in nature, other than tiny ones like photons, interact so strongly with their environment that they become entangled with it almost immediately. And that destroys any entanglement about that might have existed about the internal parts of the system and degrading it into mere correlated randomness. So this is why the world appears to be full of randomness and we can't see this, this entanglement. Now I'm going to skip forward ahead a little bit here. Uh, oh, yeah, well, of course, now we just say the world is trying to build quantum computers, including my company, IBM. And this is one of the efforts in building more and more ways of handling this very delicate dreamlike information in a way that doesn't disturb it. And it's, it's, it's extremely complicated technical challenge to keep these two qubits that you're trying to get interact with each other isolated from the whole environment well enough and yet strongly enough interacting them that they can do logic gates with the other. A much harder task than quantum cryptography, which is uh, uh, something that you can already buy quantum cryptography systems if you want one. So it's, it's, that's quite practical, although maybe of more limited usefulness, but the quantum computer is, is, is under expensive and extensive development by thousands of people all over the world trying to, trying to conquer these essentially engineering problems. Now I'm going to go back to the Einstein-Bohr debate. Uh, as I said, the weird behavior of the subatomic particles uh, it became obvious in the early 20th century. Niels Bohr in Copenhagen argued that physicists must learn to accept it. And there were two kinds of weird behavior. One was this indeterminacy, the state, the random behavior of individual particles, even under completely controlled conditions. And the other was entanglement, where two particles, no matter how far apart they were, and so there's not conceivably that they're influencing each other, and yet they behave in such a strongly correlated way, like those photons I told you about, that it seems to be too strongly correlated to be imagining that they're acting independently. And he didn't like, he, he had nasty words for each of them. He said, I don't believe that an, a perfectly identically prepared system should behave differently. In this case, radioactivity had been recently discovered, and one of the recent behave, behaviors of radioactive uh, uh, materials was, uh, 
Some of the atoms decay in the specimen of radium. Some of them will decay every day, and some of them won't. And if you go to a hospital, they say some of these patients are going to die overnight and some of them are going to still be alive. Well, the ones that died were sicker. And all these initial efforts right after the discovery of radioactivity was to see if there was some difference between the atoms, if you could sort radium into, into strong radium and weak radium, and the weak radium would decay more rapidly than the strong radium. But they, they, you could never do that. So these things seem to be exactly identical, and yet they behave differently. And the two photons going through the slit is just a non-radioactive version of the same thing. So uh, he, Einstein said he didn't like this indeterminacy because he couldn't believe that God was, was playing dice. And he didn't like entanglement because he said it's spooky action at a distance, as if what this particle does, how can it affect a particle that's too far apart to have any conceivable physical connection with it? And so he, his own theory of relativity also had this, along with Newton's mechanics and Maxwell's electromagnetism, had this property which, which Einstein thought science needed to have, and that is that every, every effect should have a cause, and it should be a nearby cause. And this seemed to be a violation of that, so he always looked for an improvement over quantum mechanics. And the rest of the physicists said, well, you know, just, just learn to live with it. Uh, now, I think it's pretty clear that, that Einstein sort of wasn't flexible enough to get this thing. Uh, entanglement are real, confirmed by experiments, and, and explained by the theory that Einstein disliked. And efforts to get a, to go beyond that theory have been unsuccessful. And I would say his mistake was viewing entanglement as a kind of influence. And as I said, with this, with this, uh, the pair of coins that turns out the same way, is that a communication between them? No. He he should have given up if the whole. The whole is in a perfectly definite state, each part of the less not true of entangled state. It's a different kind of state of the whole. And it not only allows, but it requires the parts of each part to behave randomly. Making any measurement on one member of the entangled pair gives a random result. But from that measurement, you can predict perfectly the result of the same measurement on the other particle. And that's just the, the way things behave. Now, Schrodinger understood this, and he said, he thought it was strange too, and he invented a kind of a, a word, a word that is used still, steering. That is, when you measure one particle, it steers the other. But this is a very bad word too, because if you had a car with that kind of steering, it, or two cars that were entangled, then if you turn the steering wheel of this car to the right, it might go to the right or it might go to the left. It would behave randomly, but the other car, the other car would do the same thing. So it, you wouldn't want it in your car, and it is not a form of communication. So, uh, so as I, as I would say, it's sort of the random behavior of the individual parts is, is uh, a natural and unavoidable concomitant of the, of the excessively strong correlation of entanglement. Now, this happened, was used for one of these New Age people, Nick Herbert, who tried to use it to explain sort of telepathy and uh, and that oh and Jack Sarfati tried to patent it for communicating with submarines and things like that, uh, and the the refutation of these by Deeks and Wooders and Zurich, Wooders was one of my co-authors. Zurich and, and, and Deeks was he Deeks they explained it simultaneously these these this Deeks and Wooders and Zurich something that was actually known for a while but people hadn't focused on it. Uh, that a laser, even though it's an amplifier of quantum information, can't amplify it in a way that allows you to copy it. Uh, so that's, that's uh, now I'm gonna make a little discussion uh, it, going into the philosophy, or into the sort of the way that wrong, I, the role of wrong ideas in, in science. So this was a case where a wrong idea that you could use entanglement to send a message, and even use it for a practical purpose, uh, which was sort of implicit in the reason Einstein didn't like entanglement. Once it was stated in a, a, a bold enough way and refuted, it led to scientific progress. Sometimes correct ideas lead to 
uh, to slow down scientific progress. And I think this is a, a uh, uh, an example uh, in tracing some of the various earliest ideas about uh, information in physics. Now, the notion of a, a, a deterministic universe, this was implicit in the work of Galileo and, and Newton, but it was nicely stated by, by Laplace. And he said, the present state of the universe is the effect of its cause, its past and the cause of its future. And, and an intellect which knew the present state of the universe and the laws that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that regulate it, if it were also, uh, when it says analysis, it means what we would call computation, uh, they would, this, this intelligence would know the future and the past of everything, and, and the future would be symmetrically like the past completely known to it. So, uh, and this is, this as it turns out is, is, that was a very revolutionary idea. It was so revolutionary that physicists, even physicists started forgetting it. What's my time doing? Oh, I don't have a lot, but I have a few, few more things to say here. Uh, so this was, this idea, uh, This idea will, in a way, I've already showed you that the same idea exists in quantum mechanics, that the, since the state of the whole evolves deterministically, you would have the same notion. If you knew the laws of nature of the universe, you would know how it evolved. The individual inhabitants of the universe might see random, random things happening, but you would understand all the probabilities of those things being happened. So it's the same, the same paradox exists. Uh, but now I want to say something about Physics, the other part of physics that has been illuminated by thinking about it in informational terms. Now, one of the most famous laws of physics is uh, the second law of thermodynamics. And it's famous for having many unrelated, seemingly unrelated manifestations that are, that are uh, uh, in fact, equivalent to each other. And the, uh, the one of the earliest ones was uh, that heat cannot pass from, uh, by, spontaneously pass from uh, a colder body to a hotter body. And then Clausius's form of it, no physical process has the sole result of transforming heat into work. Uh, a, a nice manifestation of this that you can see if you're involved in, in, in creating uh, a baking ceramics in a, in a kiln at a high temperature where you can see it glow is that in a uniformly hot furnace, you can't see anything by the light of the furnace's glow. I think ice skating is another, is another manifestation of the second law. Because ice floats, it has to melt under pressure. And the, the, all of these laws can be encapsulated in a form that was found by my mentor, at I, my late mentor at IBM, and Ben Schumacher, and says, look, these things are all have to do with information. And the, the way it could be put in, in a way that in generalizes all the others is that no physical process has the sole result of erasing information. So this, this is, uh, now the, the, where this, what this has to do with information and paradoxes comes from a maxwell Demon argument. This was made by Maxwell in 1867. How many people here have heard of Maxwell's Demon? Okay, so you can read about it in Maxwell's own words. The idea is that if there was a, a, a small being who could observe individual molecules, Maxwell had just worked out the laws of motion for how a gas behaves and exerts pressure by random collisions among the atoms. So he said, of course, in a, a volume of gas, not all the particles are traveling at the same speed. Uh, and therefore, if you could have a, a volume divided into two halves with a hole in the middle that could be open and closed, there could be someone without disturbing the molecules could let them pass from one side to the other and get all the hot molecules on this side and all the slow molecules on that side and therefore make a, uh, a temperature difference where there was no temperature difference. Uh, in other words, ha having heat pass from a cooler to a hotter. Uh, and so he proposed this paradox without having solved it. Now the paradox, 
was actually solved by one of the great Polish physicists, Smolkowski. I'm probably not saying how's his, his name correctly, but I'm trying. He said, well, don't, you don't worry about sorting the, hot, the faster from the slower ones. Let's take a, a, a box which is divided into two parts and has a trap door in between, and it just, with a little spring on it. And so if a molecule hits from this side, it goes to that side. It works like a lobster. I guess you don't have lobsters in Europe. It works like a, a lobster trap. If the, if the molecules go in here, they can't get back because it, the door is shut and it bounces off. So eventually they get all over here and you get compressed air for free. So that's just as much a violation of the second law. But Smolkowski, his, his other work was to explain fluctuations in a uniform medium, like the fact that the, the sky is blue because it's a random collection of air molecules but just for statistical reasons, there are more air molecules in some little volume than in other, and this means that light, whose refraction depends on the density of the air, doesn't follow a straight path, and the shorter the wavelength, the more the particle, and he explained this quantitatively. So he was very interested in these fluctuations, and he said, this demon doesn't work because if you made it, this door would come to the same temperature as the gas, and it would be flapping open and shut all the time, and just as often, as a molecule pushed through it, the reverse would happen, which is the door is flapping and the molecule comes from this side and the door knocks it through like a, like a baseball bat. And the two things happen equally often, therefore it doesn't work. Now this explanation somehow got forgotten for many years and was rediscovered in, by several people and I was part of that in the later, mid, middle to late 20th century. This, essentially, this problem was already stated by Maxwell, solved by Smolkowski, and then the solution was forgotten for a while. And one of the reasons the solution was forgotten, uh, I think, was the success of quantum mechanics. Despite Laplace's deterministic universe, in which you would say the whole universe, including the thoughts of any humans that might be in the universe, is explained entirely predictable from the past, an extremely revolutionary idea, but a very simple idea. The physicists started thinking about mental processes as somehow being somewhat different, not as physical processes. Laplace, I don't think, he excluded people's minds from that. Uh, and this came out in another very smart person's paper, Leo Szilard, Zillard, who uh, had this story about the decrease of entropy in a thermodynamic system by the intervention of intelligent beings. Now, the, the Szilard actually understood the, the Smolkowski and he understood the thing it couldn't work, but he somehow, uh, pe people who read his paper took it to mean that the act of measurement somehow has some irreversibility involved in it. Uh, and this led people for looking, and then the success of quantum mechanics in which measurement which was previously an uncontroversial uh, notion was, was in some cases not possible. People jumped to the conclusion because quantum mechanics showed that some measurements can't be made or some pairs of measurements can't be made. They jumped to the conclusion that in a thermodynamic system, some measurements can be made, but they must necessarily be energetically costly. Those are two different ideas, and one of them is correct and the other isn't. Uh, so Landauer un under, under learned that the problem with the reason that, this, uh, that, that, that these efforts to uh, harness uh, fluctuations and turn them into a source of energy wouldn't work is because they all involve information erasure. And in the Maxwell's problem, the demon, having observed which side the molecule came from, before he can prepare his mind to learn where, which side the next molecule came from, he would have to forget where the first molecule came from, and the erasure of that information is the costly act. So Landauer gave us this insight. <clears throat> well, so now I'll, this is another brilliant person, Dennis Gabor also Hungarian. He had this invention for harnessing the, the, the energy of a single molecule and, and getting useful work out of it. 
His idea was to have a recirculating light beam in a very tall cylinder, and the molecule is wandering around in the cylinder, and as soon as the molecule wanders into the light beam, you put this piston into place, uh, and then you allow the molecule to collide against the piston, gradually absorbing heat from its environment and, and expanding the piston. And if you work out the formula for expanding, this is a, what you would call a high compression engine powered by one molecule of gas. The amount of work you can get out of it is the, is the average thermal energy of a single molecule multiplied by the logarithm of the volume ratio, the expansion ratio. <laughs> that works for, for ordinary gasoline engines. So my question, homework question, is what keeping is, keeps it from breaking the second law? And uh, the easy part of the answer is uh, the correct answer, and the hard answer is, is, is what Gabor said about uh, why it wouldn't work. And I leave you with one more little uh, so here's, here's a problem. I, I don't think I quite understand the answer, but I know there must be a, a, a flaw with it. Okay, so this device is an anemometer, and it, because of the sh cup-shaped, uh, 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 ends of these, of these three uh, arms, a wind in any horizontal direction will make it turn in, in one way. So why doesn't this thing why can't you use this thing to do work if you just immerse it in a gas that has no wind in it? Because according to Smolkovsky and, Will, and Maxwell, a gas that has no wind always has microscopic amounts of wind blowing in random directions. So, and yet there, you shouldn't be able to drive a motor with, with a gas that is at rest and it's all at the same temperature. So that's, that's a homework question. But I think now I've come to the pretty much the end of the the, the talk. Oh I, no, this is more important. I think this is, has some do. With, people ask what kind of science should I go to, and and I I think that the lessons some of this is preaching to the choir, but the most science is is less done by individuals. Like it's not some great breakthrough or great discovery. It's mostly incremental. Uh, the most important applications are rarely the ones that people think of at first. Uh, and even in applied science, like the things that are currently popular and very exciting, like uh, machine learning and quantum computing, they go through periods of, of being being overestimated and being underestimated. Let's take, let's take uh, artificial intelligence. In the 1950s, when big computers were first rolled out, people thought, oh, well, we'll use them for language translation. And uh, people in artificial intelligence have been trying to work on that for, for uh, 70 years. And for most of that time, the progress was, was pitiful. And now, it's, it, it really works pretty well. So sometimes it takes a long time for an idea to come to fruition. Uh, so this is OK. So that's preaching to the choir. You probably wouldn't be here if you didn't believe that. Now, uh, and this, is, this was put in nicely by Michael Faraday, uh, also over 100 years ago. He was giving some lectures uh, about his new discoveries, including the element chlorine. And somebody asked him, what, what's, it, what's it going to be used for? And he says, I can't do any better than what Benjamin Franklin said when they were asking him about electricity. Uh, and that is, what is the use of an infant? So I, we had in IBM, which is, as, as you know, it's, it's a commercial enterprise rather than a university. Somebody came from the, from the commercial part and said he wanted to work with our quantum information group so that he could make great breakthrough discoveries. And I thought of saying to him, but I, I was too kind to say that that's like making a firm decision to be spontaneous. And my last slide, I think this is just about the last, yeah. But this was a, this was a, a I met a scientist at the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, 
who was nearing his retirement, and he said he'd worked on a lot of things in his life, but his proudest work was on the Voyager spacecraft. And this, as you remember, the two spacecraft used this gravitational slingshot to explore the four big outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, well, the scientists proposed this because of the way the planets were arranged, they could do that. And the word came back from Washington, just do Jupiter and Saturn, people have heard of those. But then they said, well, you know, we really should do all the four because the planets won't be good, good in a good position for 200 years. And the word came back from Washington, Congress understands about two years, not 200 years, just do Jupiter and Saturn. So then, then the, the people who were on the project in, engaged in a quiet conspiracy, in which they, they built everything to last three or four times as long and to function in three or four times as far, or five times as far away from the sun as, as it was designed to. And then once it was launched, they suggested years later that it actually be rerouted to explore these other outer planets, and it did. So the moral is, uh, don't lie to the funders too often, but you should do it when it's necessary to get some good science done. Uh, and lastly, what is good about quantum information? And the physics of information, understanding the energy cost of information processing, new kinds of cryptography, progress towards quantum computers and the quantum internet. It's gradual and there's a lot of hype about it, but it does promise to dramatically ease some currently difficult information processing tasks. And examples are optimization, secure cloud computing, computational chemistry, and some other things. Already there's progress on, on uh, uh, what do I say, uh, precision measurement. I haven't mentioned that here. Uh, and then progress in a theoretical sense on some of the deepest problems in physics, like the origin of space-time, uh, as thinking of it as a possible result of entanglement, and understanding what happens to the information that you drop into a black hole and when it, in its relation to what comes out. So this is, a, and besides, as I explained to you already, it's not too hard to understand. So this is why everybody should know a little bit about it the way know, they know a little bit about black holes, even though they can't do any calculations on them. Thank you for your attention. And now we have a time uh, for a conversation without borders uh, between Professor Charles Bennett and Mr. Karol Jawachowski. So what, what, would be, what, what would be those um, Underestimate, underestimated ideas in science that you mentioned, uh, because you, you mentioned that some ideas are over, overestimated. Well, some for example, at the beginning of, of the com computing, one of the first things they thought computers would be used for is a lang natural language translation. Like they would say, oh, we should be able to type into a typewriter, then there's a computer and it and you type in in English, it comes out in French. That turned out to be infeasible, and it led to a lot of research in language and the ambiguity in language, and the uh, one of my, it was not much later, it was in the 1960s, uh, I had some roommates who were, who were involved in, in building com com computers at the time, and another roommate who was a, a language translator. Uh, knew many languages, and, and her, her profession was translating technical manuscripts. So uh, my information geek friends said, I want to give you a sentence in English, and you should produce all possible translations of it into French, with the eye to demonstrating the ambiguity of language. And so they, they chose one, which was... Uh, Jane made the robot fast. And so she, so, so first of all, so you can make many interpretations of it in English. It, could, it prevented the robot from eating. Uh, she assembled the robot quickly. Uh, she seduced the robot very quickly. Uh, she made the robot so that when you washed it in hot water, the colors wouldn't wash out of it. So these are all, the, and then these were all translated into French in many ways. And so, so it, this, this kind of ambiguity but then for, for, something like uh, 50 or 60 years retarded the, the 
processing of, of natural language to to a point where it was pretty, pretty much useless. And now we have, uh, if you take a piece of a newspaper article in, 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 in one language and run it through Google Translate, you can pretty much understand. And even if you, if, if you can see where the computer has gone way off because it took one meaning of the word, which obviously to a human doesn't make sense in the context, but it, it really pretty work, much works. But they thought it would work for 70 years before it really did work. And so ideas go through periods. Remember when they thought everybody would be flying around in helicopters, now we would have flying cars. Well, we still don't have flying cars, but we may have self-driving cars. But uh, so it's natural for, and, and, and then remember the era in which they built, they installed way more optical fiber than they needed because they thought it was going to be the thing that they needed. Well, of course, now they do need it, but, but it's natural, it's a natural part of human invention to over and underestimate the importance of something. It's the same problem as this person who said they wanted to do breakthrough research. <laughs> right, right. And do you have a feeling about contemporary ideas, the idea that present in contemporary science that might be terribly underestimated? Well, what somebody was expressing, how they put it, that the, the one that I'm closest to is quantum internet and quantum computers is, is a uh, the witch's brew of hype and hope. So they're very, there's very exciting ideas for progress but when that, when that is the, the environment, I used to say that so, so many different physical systems can be used for quantum computing. Um, there are many even now that are being considered like nitrogen vacancies in diamond and, and, uh, and ion traps and, and superconducting materials of various sorts. But in earlier years, there were even more ideas. And I would used to say that, that Every physicist would look in his laboratory and and decide, let's see if I can get a grant for this piece of equipment by saying that it's a potential quantum computer. <laughs> so, so when you have a high degree of interest, you have unavoidably a high degree of hype and a high degree of of people who want to make their incremental research sound more important than it is. Uh, but I guess that's unavoidable. It's, the other alternative is the way this field used to be, where an important discovery was very clearly expressed and understood by a few people in 1970, and nothing much about happened to it for another 13, 15 years, because nobody nobody had it thinking about it as their as their day job. And, and you mentioned that building a proper quantum computer is, is mainly an engineering problem. And that, that's your opinion, or that's the official IBM stance? Well, I think it's the, if, if the opinion of anyone who is involved in trying to build a quantum computer that it, there's not a, there are some, there's some people, even some scientists, who think that quantum computing is an idea that must fail for, for, for fundamental reasons in the sense of a perpetual motion machine. And, and, and I think there, there, there was a famous debate between the computer scientist uh, Gil Kalai and uh, one of our quantum information colleagues, uh, uh, Aram, Aram Harrow. And the, I think the, the, uh, the what Aram Harrow's way of casting this, which he may have gotten from somebody else, was to say that uh, quantum computers are the heavier than air flying machines of the 21st century. In other words, there are people in the, in the 19th century who thought the only way that you could fly was with a balloon. And you understand how a balloon works. That you, you couldn't make a flying machine. Well, then in a few decades later, they did make them, and now we use them a lot. And of course, they could have looked at insects and birds and say, well, if they can do it, why can't we? Which I think is what the Wright brothers thought. <laughs> but so, so there are people who don't believe, but, 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 but I think the consensus is that it's possible, but it's very hard. And what you see is that every, every week or two, there's supposed to be some breakthrough, which is actually important incremental progress. But the progress is, is it's a little bit like uh, fusion. We know it's possible in principle. We know that it's, certainly we know it's possible because that's where the sunlight comes from. But to build a machine that does it safely and economically is 
is has been it's a process of problem is making some progress even lately, but hasn't hasn't produced a result in 70 years. Maybe we're just a little impatient. So I think that's what the situation requires. That's what I mean when I say this engineering. Yeah, but there are, there are some scientists, some quite serious scientists, that, that say that it's, it might be some fundamental lack of our knowledge, that quantum theory might be some, somewhat uh, incomplete, and it just prevents us from understanding what happens between this micro and macro. I think that you can say that, but it is so simple and coherent, and I think it's a little bit like the, the idea that's, that there's something, the people who say that I think have taken in the connection, how the, the smooth and simple evolution of the system of a whole under quantum laws not only allows, but necessitates the random behavior of the parts. The two things that Einstein didn't like were separately ugly, but putting them together makes a beautiful whole. And I think people who, who have this gut feeling that quantum mechanics is wrong are, are, are suffering from that same problem. It's, it's a little bit reminds me of the problem that, that delayed the understanding of continental drift. Because if you look at, the, I forget who was the first person who noticed that Africa and South America fit together much too much to, for that to just to happen by chance. Uh, and then you, you observe some similar rocks in the two places, so there's a lot of evidence for it. But people said, well, you know, rocks can't move. But you know, what if you do, if, what if they're, they're a little bit fluid, so much so that you can't see them move, the very high viscosity, and you give them hundreds of millions of years to move. Well, of course they can move. And then there's even understanding of how they can move in a very slow convection. But it's sort of a failure of imagination. And I think the, the good scientist must be open to, to giving up things that seem obvious because there seems to be a little problem with it. And the, 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 the just example of the, even the relativity, special relativity, with the, the failure of the Michelson-Morley experiment. If you, if you looked at the laws of electromagnetism and you realize that they're not invariant under, under Galilean relativity, that they are under, under uh, Lorentzian, uh, what is it, uh, Lorentz transformations, which I think Einstein probably understood. And then he said, well, maybe this means that's the way we should be thinking of space and time. But the, the, the idea that there was a luminiferous ether and the Earth had to have some velocity through it was, was a, a, a sticking with old ideas that were beginning to show signs of being wrong. Now, there's, in, 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 in uh, more in philosophy and literature, there's a, there's a story by Borges, which is, I think it's called, uh, it's not a story, it's a sort of essay, it's called Avatars of the Tortoise, mm -hmm. in English, I didn't read it in Spanish. Uh, and the idea is that paradoxes such as the Zeno paradox of, of, of how, or the Achilles and the Tortoise paradox, of how by the time the, the Achilles attached catches up with the tortoise, the tortoise isn't there anymore. So Achilles has to do infinitely many things in order to get ahead of the tortoise. And how can you do infinitely many things in a finite amount of time? Uh, and, and most people don't consider that a serious problem. And it's pretty much solved by calculus. But Borges takes the, the, the position that the notion of infinity in the way it manifests itself in its connection to the world and the fact that it produces these paradoxes, his position is that the paradoxes are, are hints left by God that what we are experiencing isn't real. That essentially we're a, we're a program running in God's mind. We're not a real world because there's, the real world has contradictions in it. And if it were real, it couldn't have these contradictions. So that's, that's a very philosophical, but scientists have to, and there are things that are in, 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 in thermodynamics and cosmology that are that paradoxical now. That where, the, the, probably the hardest one is the, where does the arrow of time come from? Why is the, why is the, uh, 
so, but you, you have to get used to those and then somehow worry about them at the same time as hoping that there's something there that if you look at it a different way, you can understand it. Do you recall, do you recall any moments that your, your imagination failed? Do you recall that, that such, such moments? Oh, oh, oh. You just didn't I notice can, that, I can, that hint given by God. Oh, I can think of, well, I'm, this one was uh, in connection with re reversible computation. Landauer showed that the cost of computation, the irreducible cost of it in terms of uh, irreversibility, in terms of thermodynamics, energy dissipation, occurred with irreverse, logically irreversible steps. And he said, well, of course, any computation, you have to generate some intermediate data that you don't want, and then when you erase it. And then I started thinking about, well, let's see how much information you have to erase in a typical computation. And the more I tinkered with it, the more I could realize that you didn't have to erase anything by doing it the right way. So that was sort of being, being corrected by one's own thinking, which is the, the, the least painful way of changing mind in science. But then uh, a, a more painful way, but very honorable way, is what happened when, when I told this to Landauer. And he said, yes, you're right, computation is intrinsically reversible. So instead of being annoyed at me for arguing with his idea, he, 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 he was excited by it. And I think you asked me a th third thing, which is, have I changed my mind about something that way? It's, it's, it's not so much about um, a scientific thing, but almost a, uh, uh, an attitude of, 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 well, you know what, it's technological optimism. It's the idea that, well, humans have created various problems like climate change and so on. But there's ways of fixing this, and because we have intelligence and we can devise, you know, for example, putting a lot of, uh, of uh, sulfates into the air, we can reduce the reflective, increase the reflectivity of the atmosphere. We may produce some other things. The ocean may get even more acid, but there's stuff that we can do and throw some limestone into the ocean. That we have our ingenuity to rely on to, to, uh, and so I had, in, in my general outlook, had been a technologically optimistic because I was impressed by the creativity of science and, and, and technology. Well, then I began thinking about uh, Earth history and, and, and cosmology, and I realized that uh, that uh, that life apparently started very soon after the Earth got cool enough for it, and then waited around for around half the lifetime of the sun before any complex life happened. And then as far as humans and, and, and civilization, that was around about a few millionths of the lifetime of the sun as that's been around. So I began saying to my, so thinking about the Fermi, Fermi paradox, that is, we, we, we don't have any evidence of extraterrestrial civilizations. If there were ones in our galaxy, and they were successful, they would have colonized the galaxy by now and we would know about them unless we were very suspicious and they're scared of us and are hiding from us or something. But I think that probably they would, they would I mean, uh, the United States didn't hide from Japan when we decided that we wanted to trade with them. We just sent them some gunboats and they said, okay, we've got to change. So I think that would happen to us if there were, uh, I think that, so I think that this, the evidence suggests that Civilization is, is very infrequent in the universe and maybe we'll, we'll never hear of another one or, or know of another one, even by signals, uh, if it's more than a Hubble distance away, uh, nor are they of us. And also, it's a little scary that we've only been around for, uh, in terms of civilization, for a, a few tens of thousands of years, and yet we have another billion years before the sun gets too hot. So why should we be so early? Why shouldn't we have be in a, like a 500 million year old civilization worrying about what to do with when the sun gets too hot, do we want to move to Mars or something? It suggests that civilization is unstable. And then that reminded me of, of, of something that Schopenhauer wrote that was drawn to my attention by, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, Alejandro Jenkins, in a different context. He said, you know, Schopenhauer discovered the anthropic principle. That's not widely known. But he pointed out that uh, 
almost that 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 everything in life is on the brink of of failing of being of being uh people survive only with the greatest difficulty and he says that very he said the the earth seems to be habitable but a slight change in the temperature of the atmosphere would, would kill everything on the earth uh and if you take his arguments that are really put quite eloquently uh you can actually you can google it if you want to google Schopenhauer and the geometry of evil look that up and you'll see this blog post i made about which argues that Schopenhauer discovered the anthropic principle that is the idea that we find ourselves in a part of the universe that is very atypical by being habitable by being consistent with our for example the temperature of the earth and all these things being just right uh and the the uh so he, he didn't put it in geometric terms essentially say there for many parameters have to be within a narrow range then if any habitable world with high probability will be very close to one of these parameters being right near the edge of where it will fail so in other words it's natural for things to work well enough to work and not to become extinct but just barely better than that so that you shouldn't expect things to be better than they are so that that I, in this this uh uh blog posts argues that in 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 contrast to Leibniz saying that the that uh, the 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 we live in the best of all possible worlds designed by a beneficent creator for our benefit Schopenhauer said no we live in the worst of all possible worlds because most worlds are 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 almost impossible and if they were completely impossible we wouldn't be here to complain about it uh so he really enunciated that idea So I have now the you might say kind of a a technological not that technology can't solve save us but that the evidence is that that we may be one of the civilizations that isn't long lasting there there will be long lasting ones but they may be that may not be us So what the, So what I changed my mind about that right. that's really different from technological optimism okay. so would would science or knowledge would be the, the only one which is stable in the universe would be the would what science and knowledge that we create would would it be the, the only thing which is stable well except the problem is right now the universe appears to have accelerating expansion which means that if there isn't another civilization within hubble distance even if we extinct ourselves and leave just our libraries behind or spacecraft nobody will ever read them it's very lonely it's like being in the library of babel and you You, you but having some observational evidence that the part that you're in that is so nice is a very lucky neighborhood and all the other ones are moving away f- too fast for them to ever even know about you it's 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 i mean it's certainly an incentive to take better care of the earth and to try to find more uh you know uh, l- less combative systems of 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 social coexistence and governance and and we, you know of course even in a civilization that lasts uh 100 billion years or 100 million years excuse me uh there will be a part in the early part of it where it only let you know they say some people are lucky enough to be in the in the first you you know this argument this this copernican argument uh i'm trying to think of it was it was uh, uh, carlton caves gave an ex- example of where you can go too far with it he says that if you think that uh anything it's typically in not in the first 10% or the last 10% of its lifetime uh so if you go to uh to a birthday party and you ask uh how old is this person and they say they're 50 years old and you say well that's you have a good chance of living to be 150 years old maybe one chance in 3 or something you're living to be 150 or if you go to a hospital in the maternity ward and you have these parents who have their baby who's like 3 days old and you say well don't get too attached to that baby because it probably won't live longer than a month so these are reasons where the <laughs> where that argument fails so i but i haven't seen any reason why it should be fail for the argument as to why civilization might be maybe not i think it's I, i'm technological optimistic i don't think that it will make the earth so uninhabitable that 
humans can't survive, but maybe a civilization that can use technology to keep itself around for a long time won't survive if we degenerate into a lot of uh, a lot of people thriving on misinformation and and conflicts, unnecessary conflicts between not even nations, but almost think of how things were in, in failed states today where you could go from one place to another, but you need, if you're rich enough, to hire a bodyguard and an armed escort. My son was in, in Haiti right now recently because he works with the uh, uh, hospitals there. And the, 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 the government is so weak and there's so many armed gangs that the only safe way to go from one place to another in Haiti is by helicopter. So if the whole world were like that, it would have a hard time making you know, cheap smartphones. Okay, so let's go to the more <laughs> personal mode. I would like to ask you a, a, a bit more personal question about the reasons of your or origin of your curiosity. Uh, I, I think it was David Hume who, asked, who, who said that uh, obscurity is painful to the mind. And what, what is it your case? That's why you make science. That because obscurity... I don't know. I think I always wanted to be a scientist, but but uh, so I, I don't. I, it's hard to. Well, when young people ask me what if they, I was at a uh, what was called the science. What was it called? Um, it's it's a it's a, they it's a sort of competitive thing where high school seniors in, in the United States compete against one another answering science questions. And they, the, the top 100 of them from all around the country met, and I was supposed to give them a lecture. They wanted to hear about quantum, quantum computing or quantum information. And I said instead, and well, one of them said, well, what, do you, what, do you, what should you do? What should you study if you wanted to be a scientist? And I said, well, if you really are cut out to be a scientist, you are sort of naturally curious about everything. And you think about science all, all the time. Uh, so I can't tell you why you should be that way, but if you are that way, the, the, the main advice is, is not to get too, so involved in, in some specialty that you, that you lose that tendency to think about everything that way. And I gave them an example. I was, I was uh, wandering around in the town right after a storm, like a day after a storm, and I heard the sound in one of the storm sewers and the rushing water through it, and it was going <whistles> periodically, a change in volume. And that seemed very unnatural. And I looked in there and I saw the water was running in in this pulsatile way. And I said, that's very unnatural. It's just runoff from this. Well, then I looked up this, the hill a little further, and there was another storm drain and in that storm drain, the water was coming in at a steady rate from still further uphill. But in the drain, there was a sustained oscillation uh, of the water in this rectangular tank about this big. And it was the, the periodic nature of the overflow that hadn't managed to damp out in the distance to the second sewer. So I said, well, this is just like a musical instrument. You go like a and it oscillates, you have a steady driving force and it reacts in it. In the, so this is, so, so, so this is, the habit of going around and thinking about everything that way is, uh, I think it's a common habit that many people have, but maybe just because I was, uh, at, you know, until my little sister was born, I was an only child and I just played a lot by myself. So I don't know, That's, but I'd say be curious about everything and try to understand things but understand the understand them anything that you understand try to understand well enough that it seems simple and not that it seems it's it's so hard when you read scientific literature not to get oh this is something so complicated i can just barely understand it well if you just barely understand it you're probably not going to make as much progress as if you focus on some aspect of it well like that i've been focusing on re reversibility you know, I always ask if, if, if you know, what, what would this look like backwards? So that's almost, I, I'm sure I'm missing other things by not looking at other stuff. Okay, so that's all I can say about that. Okay. And do you think that uh, this 
the quantum information theory is defined is, is the intellectual framework for think, thinking about reality or is it something or does it reflect the deepest uh, reality of nature is it the, the final theory or it's just a, a tool for understanding i think it's the way it, it's it's going to be a part of the final explanation of things and the, and the real synthesis at least in terms of physics is this synthesis between uh between in other words to think that there's some kind of uh deterministic or classical in the sense of not having entanglement better basis for physics i think is is doomed the quantum is simpler and more beautiful and more in agreement with the experiment and, and you just you learn to use it's like saying i don't like irrational numbers because they can't be expressed as a ratio of two integers well you know get used to them they the of uh, the but to, to, th there are many other things in in the world besides physics but i think that it's the and these are parts of physics that i don't really understand but it seems to me that quantum information ideas to, to will help integrate uh general relativity the gravitation theory with with uh the other parts of physics that are working so well except that they don't include gravitation and so there's recent work which seems to use entanglement even as the explanation underlying cause of of four dimensional space time and 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 uh, uh things like that and also understanding the the black hole information paradox better so it's very exciting except the people who are doing it have much more education in these specialist topics than i do so i'm a spectator do you think that science is open ended or just it open ended is science open ended or there is a moment that we find find out everything we just categorize ev everything and just everything is known and then we can just r relax is there any what's your intuition well i think it's at least it includes mathematics which shows no sign of of running out of new things and so i'm going to guess that that uh Every, the, the people who say that science is about to discover everything have had about the same level of success as as the religions who say the world is going to end at a particular time i was going to ask this question as the first one but i was a bit embarrassed but i i think some of us might be interested or might feel too awkward or embarrassed to ask this fundamental question because you you made this assumption that we all know what information is what what does it mean what what what's this word what's behind this word so, but the question is where does but i just mean that we're familiar with the practical applications of it in fact okay. it's 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 something that is independent of the physical form it has to be embodied in some physical form but a bit as an electrical signal you don't even need to know what happens to your voice when you talk to somebody on the telephone it goes from sound to electrical signal to a multiplex signal of many electrical signals to something that maybe probably goes through an optical fiber uh might go through microwaves and then gets and you don't have to care about any of this uh because because of Shannon's information theory separated the the hardware of of communication from the software and it theory of universal computation separated the hardware from the software and computing and now both of these things were almost right but they left out superposition so now you have the the quantum generalization of information and computation theory but now it doesn't cover everything if you want to understand well where does where does the world come from where does where 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 does gravity fit into this and and then you need to solve these unsolved problems in physics but it looks like this informational way of looking at uh it it physics helps but let's let's assume a granddaughter of yours comes to you and asks you what what is this bit thing what is this thing called bit where does it come from where 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 does it go does it die what what's uh, what's this well, we just say it's 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 an abstraction just the way numbers are an abstraction 
you could say that uh, that uh, the number one is a way of talking about the fact that here that there's one table and one carafe of water. And then number two is the way of talking about that, that there's just two glasses and two people and two chairs. And number three is a way of talking about whatever it is that has three. And so it's it's no more mysterious than what, what a number is in, 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 in mathematics. So a bit is is the the property of having two distinguishable states. And the qubit is, is the quantum equivalent of that, of saying to, to anything that has two states and all their superpositions is a qubit. Do we, in your opinion, do we invent those things called laws of physics or we find them? In other words, are you a Platonist or, or not? <laughs> Well, if we invented them, it sounds like if they could be different. And I would, I would say many of them can't be different. They, they, they're disco you're discovering something about a, a world, even though people's cosmologies are very different, especially cosmologies that are pre-scientific cosmology. They explain how, how the world got to be the way it is. It's very different. But I don't think that a civilization on another planet would come up with with a physics that is contradictory as opposed to just uh, overlapping in both parts of a, of a larger physics than what we have. I mean, this is, I mean, the fact that you go and you look at the spectrum of other stars and they seem to be made out of the same elements as the sun, that was a discovery that it, it, it might be that they all were different. And then you would say, well, these places have different chemistry, but they didn't even have the same chemistry. And that would be probably the last last question. Uh, I remember asking a friend of yours, Gilles Brassard, about strangeness, about the strangeness of quantum theory. And he said he was surprised that I asked him such a question. He, he said that he finds nothing. Nothing is strange. Nothing about is strange yes. for him. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what I was, my whole uh, effort this evening was to get it to begin to feel natural enough to you that that part, the things that upset people about it originally don't bother you anymore. You may have some other questions, but it's like people, if they learn enough about special relativity, they don't ask, why can't you go faster than the speed of light? Are there any strange elements of the theory? I mean, strange for you. Is there any elements of strangeness that bothers you? Well, I really need to understand the the you know, the in, infinite, the, all these things that we do with quantum computing, most of it deal with with s systems with a finite number of states. And so the limits, the infinite limits of, of quantum mechanics and the the relativistic limits in the field theory, those are the places where they're real open mathematical questions. Okay, thank you. Charles, thank you. We owe you big deal and uh, I think we, you changed the way we think about the world so I would like to say thank you for that and for being here with us also. Thank you very much for this interesting conversation. Uh, I think it fits perfectly into the motto of our festival which is enjoy the science. <laughs>